Welcome to another episode of The Breakdown. We've done a few episodes on the proposed curriculum draft that the UCP is currently piloting in a very, very, very small number of schools, mostly because school boards across the province have rejected it as being not only factually incorrect uh, against current teaching standards, but straight up harmful to kids. Now, we've done a few episodes where we've talked to academics and experts on curriculum development, but we wanted to go a little bit deeper. So we reached out to a few folks from the Albertans Reject the Curriculum Draft Facebook page, and we sat down with them in a series of interviews with three different people where we talked about their concerns, not just as people who are advocating for a quality curriculum for kids, but as parents and as small business owners who are concerned about what this curriculum will do to the employability of Albertans who are growing up through the school system right now. Andrea Willman brings a fairly unique and diverse set of perspectives to the conversation around the not only the new curriculum, but the current state of the education system in Alberta. And she does that because she's wearing a bunch of different hats in the process. Uh, so Andrea is not only a teacher, she's also a parent. She's a small business owner and a successful entrepreneur. Andrea, thank you so much for joining us and being willing to, to have this conversation today. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm glad to be here. Perfect. So to, to start with, I mean, let's, the, the way that I was going to do this was I was going to approach it from why did you get involved in, in the curriculum? But because of your unique perspective, what I'd actually like to do is start with where did you see the flaws in the system before the, the whole curriculum conversation started up? Because you as a teacher have a fairly unique perspective on that that a lot of people don't get. Yeah. Um, I started in 2005. I graduated in 2005. I substitute taught for a couple of years um, while we backpacked all of Central and most of South America. Um, we put ourselves through school, my husband and I, uh, and he's a power engineer. We took turns being the one who made the money versus let's just take off for a little while and visit like we've We've done a lot. We're landlords. We like, we have a lot of hats. You're, you're right. That's the right way of saying it. 2005, graduated, subbed, found, found that I enjoyed junior high a lot, which uh, mean, might mean I'm a little crazy. I don't know. I, I hated junior high, personally. <laughs> I spent 10 years uh, in a variety of junior high classrooms, and I specialized in uh, language arts and social studies, um, but you don't actually get to control what you teach, so there was quite, quite a variety of things I got to, to play with in that time. Um, and then kids, and then temp contracts, and then it just, it just didn't, it was a lot. Um, it was a lot. You felt, you definitely feel like you're not a good mom, or a good teacher, or a good wife, or good for yourself or friend. There's just there's it's you just things break. So when my husband and I decided to try and take a new path, and we we went into the e-commerce world and taught ourselves how to build a brand, um, and how to network with people all over the world and build systems and and how to do that game, I decided to step back from the classroom and focus on that and being at home. Um, I still subbed for my friends when they'd ask in advance <laughs> uh, because the, the, the joy is still there. Being in the classroom with the kids on that side of the door, inside the classroom, that's still there. That, that pumps me up, that gives me energy. Um, the other side of the door, uh, everything that comes with it when you're not in front of the kids, um, it's always five more minutes. It'll just take you five more minutes. Uh, there's never, there was, there was just never enough time. You just feel drained. And, um, I, I'd be interested in knowing the stats from the ASEVP, the, the benefits board for teachers. I'd like to know the stats on how many people are medicated for anxiety and other mental health. I'd like to know how many people go on stress leave every year. I know a lot of them, a lot of people who are struggling and are just, just barely treading water. And that's when they know what they're teaching. And this next year, 
every teacher in every grade from K to six in every subject will be winging it. Nobody's practicing this. And the ones that are, are practicing a tiny little piece and they'll be done practicing in February, not even the whole year. Nobody is going to be ready for this. And the people who are just barely treading water right now are going to be asked to redesign everything in a way that is not, it's not gonna benefit anybody. All those things that the, the key, our overarching ideas say that they're going to fix with this new curriculum, it can't, not, not with the system the way that it is. Not when you have, tw I had 26 kids in the grade one class I subbed in this morning, 26. My son's grade two class is 20, 26 and my great daughter's grade nine, five class is 29. In the grade twos in that school, over two thirds of them qualified for the provincial funding because they're that low, they're that far behind. Those kids are in and out of the classroom all day and they're missing chunks of instruction because they're getting pulled for extra instruction. And it's, it's a shit show out there right now. And I fear what September is going to bring. This is an interesting part of the conversation that I don't think that we've really heard talked about a whole lot. And I'm really glad that you brought it up because the, a lot of the focus has been on the, 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 quite frankly, factual inaccuracies that exist in the proposed draft. Um, it's been focused on the fact that this proposed draft doesn't seem to be able to tell the difference between curriculum and pedagogy. Um, and it, it's been focused on sort of the long-term effects on, on the kids, which I think is all of those are extremely valid and extremely important points. But the, the, I haven't heard a whole lot of conversations surrounding the fact that this is going to negatively impact not only the ability of teachers to do their jobs, but, but very but real, in a very real way, their, their mental health. Yeah. Um, and these so are the that's... people we're putting, I'm putting my kids in their hands for six to eight hours a day. And I know how broken they are. That's a heartbreaking way to start this. <laughs> Sorry. No, it's, the, the, it's, it's, it's very clearly something that needs to be discussed. So I, I, I really appreciate it. I, I'm not in the thick of it right now. And that is a blessing. I'm able to hold space for a lot of people because I get it. And when they talk to me, I get it and I can hold space because I'm resilient. I'm not in that every day anymore, but like, okay, everybody's hurting. I get it. Alberta, the, here's the, I get this a lot is that teachers aren't special. Everybody's hurting. Everybody's, and I, and I get that on a societal level though, if we have a public education system that we value, Shouldn't school be that place where the kids who are coming from homes who are losing jobs and, and homes who don't have enough to eat, shouldn't school be the place that they go to get a break from all of that? It's not, it's not anymore. All of that is in the classroom and it makes it so that you can't learn. You can't learn if you're hungry. You can't learn if you know that your parents are stressed out and you can't learn if your teacher can't spend more than 30 seconds with you at a time. If, it's, if we've forgotten how to have relationships through this pandemic, adding outcomes and adding all of this onto the plate isn't going to fix that. It's going to backfire. You can't, you can't fix it by just adding onto the plate. The, the plate's being dropped. It's, there's, you can't just like look, it's, there's nothing left. Like. So your, your advocacy, I think is, is unique in the conversations that I've had so far because it's coming not only from a place of concern about the the curriculum, which is a dumpster fire, um, but it's also coming from the concern about what the the long term effects of this curriculum and the extra workload is going to have on on teachers. Mm -hmm. uh, what I, I gotta ask, like what. That that is a, a, an incredibly compassionate and informed place to be coming from. What what got you there? 
I had to choose choose to con- consistently be in there or not. And it's not a matter of just, it's the weirdest thing. They, they're fixing it by adding emails to the day, reminding you to take care of yourself <laughs> and reminding you to put mental health first. We're like, yeah, because another email today is going to make that happen. Great. Like, and, and the people who, who judge the system for being bloated at the top, that's not disingenuous. There are a lot of positions that that take funding uh, away from the classroom. And I, I get it. The initiatives are always to fix something, but adding adding isn't always fixing. Removing stuff would be great. If you wanna add stuff, you add the joy back. You add the music back and the outdoor education and getting out in nature and field trips. And you add that, but that's all been cut. That's not there anymore. My kid is in grade five. She should be in band, but that doesn't exist in Grand, grade, grand Prairie anymore. Grade five and six in the district. Nope. Starting grade seven now because we can't afford it. So. So it, it, please correct me if I'm wrong, but kind of what I'm hearing is that you're coming from a place where there are tremendous systemic problems oh yeah Um, Yeah. and they they should be addressed in a way that's meaningful and effective and not just a performative email saying you're doing great uh or you should be or maybe work on doing better i guess um (laughs) but don't forget to document document everything there you go uh but you're also looking at so you're looking at a system that's already critically stressed and you're looking at the addition of this this curriculum and you're going, my God, what are the effects of this thing going to be? Is that a fair statement? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So let's 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 take a step back then and go. Why is this curriculum bad from your perspective? We'll start. I want to get two perspectives. So I want to get why is this curriculum bad in, in your perspective as a teacher? But I also want to get. After that, why is this per- curriculum bad from your perspective as a, a, a parent and a mom? But let's start with the teacher bit first. So what, what do you not like about this thing? And I know there's so much to choose from. <laughs> um, there's 500 pages. Uh, where to start? When you read a curriculum as a teacher and you're trying to picture the lesson that goes with it, Um, and a document and you're not sure whether the document says we're going to give you a standardized test based on this sentence or not like some of it sounds like that's going to be on the on the test so I guess I better teach it to those words in that order or right like some of it is definitely worded that way and Kenny's gone on the record a couple times saying standardized tests all the way down to div one uh which sorry div one is grade one two and three um we, you can't tell what's going to be sp- explicitly tested and what's just kind of like, you can't, it's really messy. So in the grade two, for example, grade two social studies, social studies gets all of the, all of the focus, but that's because social studies is, is storytelling and, and humans operate by telling stories. So it's really hard to tell a story with the math and the science concepts. Although, I mean, we could go down that track too, but this one, this one is, is, is the thought process of reading one outcome and what that actually means. Like what, what entails looking at an outcome and thinking through what that's actually going to look like in the classroom. So um, this curriculum outcome reads as students describe the way that ideas, beliefs, religion, and cultural practices spread back and forth between the Middle East Africa, Europe, and Asia, and eventually to other places around the world. Okay, uh, that we, we do that in grade eight currently, just so you know, <laughs> it's in the curriculum for grade eight. Um, all right, so knowing what, I, what needs to be done and bring it down to a, grade, to a grade two level, to a seven-year-old's understanding. All right, here's how you have to think that through. First, they're gonna need to know what a continent is. Um, and at this point, at this point in the current curriculum, they are, they've just breached the fact that Grand Prairie is in Alberta 
and that's in Canada, and we're going to learn some, some other places in Canada. So that's currently what they teach in grade two, but not, not yet continents, which is fine. I mean, I have a map in my living room, my kitchen. Uh, we talk about continents at home. So they're going to need to know that continents are what they are, but the one we're on isn't what we're going to be talking about. That's going to be tough, but we can do it. All right, let's talk about how ancient Greece and Rome have different lines on the map than what they, so we can show you Greece and, and Rome on this map, but what we're going to talk about doesn't look like that. Okay, so they changed. All right, and the Middle East is a collection of countries, but it's not a continent, even though Europe is also a collection of countries, but it is a continent. Uh, but we're going to let that one slide because this draft document says that Europe is a continent, even though it's not separate from Asia. They're going to they're gonna have a lot of questions about that. Anyway, that's dumb. But if a kid is looking at different maps, video games, and they all have different opinions, they're going to look to the teacher to tell them which one's right. So for our purposes, this Europe is a continent, but the Middle East is not. All right, good. Okay, so say they get that. And we need to explain that the countries inside those borders have changed over time. So ancient Greece and Greece, the, the Greece that we see on our globes, those are two different things. Okay. All right. Color map. Are we talking about a blank map where they have to draw their own lines? Um, these are kids who are just barely learning to put spaces between their words properly. Okay. Uh, is this a map of the world now? And then we're just going to highlight on top of it where the lines were compared to they are where they are now? Or, and is that for ancient Greece and medieval Europe or both or either? I don't know. All right. Go back to the top. Yep, no, Middle East, Europe. Okay, yeah, well, we've, we've just covered uh, <laughs> Middle e the Middle Evil Europe, medieval, sorry, uh, <clears throat> earlier in the curriculum, so okay. All right, we're gonna pick a lane. We're gonna start memorizing the maps. We don't know how far it is to Calgary, but we're gonna know some distances over there. All right, back up to the top. Where have I, where, where can I go with this? Uh, go back to the, the overarching guide, go back to my document and make sure I know what it's saying. All right, spread cultural practices back and forth. Okay, cultural practices. What are cultural practices when you're seven? Do you have one? Do your friends? Does your school have cultural practices? Does your city? How about core beliefs? Okay, do you have a core belief when you're seven? Does your family, does the school? Does Canada have core beliefs? All right. How about ancient Greece? What were their core beliefs? And Africa. You know, there's five, 54 countries there. Which one are we talking about? Okay. How do you know what somebody's beliefs are? Okay. All right. Fine. We make a list. Core beliefs. We make a list. We memorize it. We test it. Whatever. What's a religion? 30% of Albertans don't actually identify with a religion. So we're going to have to teach what that means then have you like our, our classrooms are pretty diverse now so everybody's going to get to share their religion if they have one uh that's that's gonna take a lot of time all right quickly quickly let's move forward um memorize test uh what have we missed oh yeah cultural practices what are the cultural practices how many from each of these places are we talking about middle east europe asia which part of Africa? There's 3,000 tribes in Africa. Which cultural practices are we talking about here? Okay, I will ask my teacher partner who doesn't know either because this there's no documents to guide us through this right now. There's no ready-made stuff unless we are taking the ones from West, or which one is it, Virginia, West Virginia? Some of the piloting people are using American stuff and the other ones have signed NDAs. We don't know what's out there. All right, <clears throat> so we've memorized facts, we've reinforced it. Let's talk about how these humans moved from one, way, one area to the other. Remember, this is before electricity, cars, trains, planes, phones, computers, postal services. Oh my God, Mrs. Millman, have you been alive since before cars? Uh, no. <laughs> But let's, let's talk about that trip and uh, who would have made that trip. Why do people travel? Was there tourism back then? 
this is not like your trip to Cancun. Would you have gone there if you had to walk or use a boat or a horse and cart before they paved the roads? What language would they use to trade? Language is cultural. Who translated before Google? Grade twos want to know. Uh, which ones are they going to be able to understand and what are we really testing them on? The, the words from the document are that students will describe the ways that ideas, beliefs, religion, cultural practices are spread back and forth between the Middle East, Africa, Europe, and Asia, and eventually to other places around the world. <sighs> okay, so out loud, I have another five minutes on just this one half of an outcome. Like, they're going to have to draw a map of eight Athens, Sparta, Mediterranean Sea, the Aegean Sea, and the Ionian Sea uh, to trace the expansion of Islam beginning in 622 AD. Okay, so now they're going to need to know how to map and how a timeline works. And when you're moving on a timeline, that's going forward or backward in math. That's positive and negative number lines. Okay, when you're seven, here he goes. Okay. Uh, so is this, is this skill to trace it? Does that mean there needs to be like time frames? What does that activity look like? How do I know if a seven-year-old without being able to spend lots of hands-on time, without being able to show lots of documentaries and, and everything, but the way this is written, uh, you have a maximum of two weeks to cover that half of an outcome if they get social studies every day. And that kind, of, that kind of overload is in all of the subjects that they're going to put on all of the grades all at the same time. Is there, can I ask, if, if, I mean, <laughs> yeah, the fact that you were able to unpack that uh, one small, outcome, outcome. small little outcome into so many ideas, have you seen any evidence that, I mean, the way that I would cautiously approach things from a pragmatic sense, and I have a feeling I'm setting myself up for some disappointment here, but the way that I would approach that is I would want to see the, the math stuff that you just talked about, the timelines, the positives, the negatives, yeah. numbers. I, I, I feel like that should run parallel to this, this lesson. I'm, you're shaking your head already. So No, the grade two math doesn't have time timelines in it. No, this would be at a separate lesson within the social studies section, not math. Well, that's not confusing at all then. No. <laughs> so it's to, to just, say that it's just very coloring important. a map is a big deal. Like I was in grade one today, coloring skills <laughs> for seven year olds. I'm, I'm pretty sure I was, I was still chewing on the crayons in grade one. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I had a kid stab himself with a pencil this morning trying to get more eraser out of the back of his pencil. So that, do they, does this, does, does the curriculum include time for dealing with pencil injuries? No, not at all. Um, yeah. But you raise a really important, you raise a really important point there because, uh, and we talked about this a little bit in the, 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 the before the interview part, uh, pre-interview, I suppose would be the professional term. Um, but there's also a lot of distractions that the teachers, I shouldn't even say distractions, unexpected occurrences that the teachers have to navigate. Yeah. At the same time as trying to navigate this, I, I feel like dumpster fire has become an underwhelming term at this point. So I don't know. I, radioactive dumpster fire perhaps um but with all of that going on you you ha teachers have to navigate all the other stuff so like the kid who 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 stabbed himself with with a pencil i mean well that was in, easy you just you just send him to the wonderful people at the front office and they patch him up and he comes back that's it's not the hard part like it's it's the ones who come to school without food when your school doesn't have a breakfast program it's the ones who come and are permanently in freeze, flight, or fight uh, because their anxiety issues come out differently. Um, it's, it's the difference in opinion of a, of a family who is super okay with their grade fives watching Squid Game and, and all of that. Oh, yeah. 
uh, and and the families that maybe maybe don't want their kids watching Squid Game. That was a big deal. Uh, in grade two? No, grade well, grade fives. It came up uh, in okay. my daughter's class. Yeah. Okay. And, oh, although you want to know how many grade twos I saw in the playground reenacting Squid Squid Game that very next week. I don't. I don't want to know the answer to that. I haven't. I haven't seen it. I haven't watched it. Um, I've. Uh, I've heard things. I. I it's not. It's just, yeah, my daughter went to a sleepover, and they watched it. They watched the first episode, and she came home, and uh, she didn't sleep for a couple of days. And I was like, "All you can do is like, that must have been really hard to watch. That's a lot of people dying very visually." And that's not mm-hmm. in her normal realm of uh, of stuff, but like, so yeah, that, like the, yeah. the 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 different perspectives that meet each other in the classroom these days isn't given enough given enough time to like to hold space for each other. You're just in each other's way on your way out the door a lot of the time, and that's physically. Uh, if you have 36 grade eights in a class and six of them are on IPPs with two of them on the spectrum and no EA to help you, it's physically impossible to help everybody the way that each person needs to be helped. You can't, you can't individualize in a 40 minute block for 36 kids with varying needs. Now you used a, a, an acronym there that I want to talk about for just a sec, because I think it also speaks to kind of what the, the role of schools is and can be and that phrase was IPP so for members of our audience who may not be familiar with the term what is an IPP it's an individualized program plan and what typically would uh precipitate a kid receiving an an actual to get an actual IPP you need to be coded and what does coded mean Coded means you are coded for a, dis- a learning disability, a learning difficulty. Um, you are you are so off the norm on your bell curve for whatever that you get extra funding. Um, but that funding only comes if it's through official testing. Testing is about two years behind pace because there's only so many testers and there's that many kids in line. Um, so unless you are crazy, crazy in need, you are not jumping that line. You're waiting years before you get tested and get that funding or you go private. It's about $2,000 to get tested privately. Okay. And who writes these IPPs? Uh, those would be those, the actual clinicians, like with lots of letters at the end of their names. (laughs) But it's. Are, are teachers involved at all in triggering that process? Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. When you, when you flag it, but it has to be, it has to be documented enough for long enough to have that paper trail to validate your spot in the line. Okay. So you when we're talking be, about. It can't just be an opinion. It has to be yeah. a cross multiple places documented opinion. My son but, has an APP on the other hand. An APP is a non-funded action plan um, for kind of the same stuff, but you're not bad enough to, to get funding. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> it's the, all right, but the, the, you have to document smaller goals that are individual to that, to that kid and then um, put steps in place and track it and have and get parent signatures and and it's a it's a lot of paperwork um it adds about an hour and a half to your report card times worth of paperwork uh for one (laughs) so if you have six (laughs) um right so uh there's a lot of kids who need a lot of individualized help and it's it's not funded. So there's no EAs. Like my, my son has uh, the APP for pullout. Like he needs a little extra physical activity because there's, you don't get gym every day anymore. You can have uh, daily physical activity, um, 
but that's that's not a centralized plan. There's no curriculum for that. It's, hey, just get them moving for half an hour. Um, it's, not, it's not quite the same as, as phys ed class because you don't get to use the gym most of the time. And if the weather's bad, then you are in your classroom, physical activity. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so my son does well when he gets movement breaks turns out cardio brings him back jacked so he actually needs problem solving and uh, physical lifting kind of thing like uh, more weight training than the, he's seven so that sounds weird but if he did laps uh, he, he would be less focused when he came back and that's that's stuff you only find out through trial and error um, so I'm happy that he has a document because that document gets to go to the next teacher and they don't have to learn by trial by fire the next year. They can, they can build on that, but the person who pulled them last year doesn't exist anymore. So it doesn't happen. Okay. So this is, I mean, to me, that underscores another really important point in that the, the role of the, the teacher is not as some may present it, which is purely stand and deliver the, the prescribed curriculum. No. It is to make that curriculum work in a way that works for the kids. And that includes kids that are gonna require more supports that very often aren't funded for. So it's not just a, is it, have you seen any indicate, I'll just get, get right to it. Have you seen any indication that this curriculum provides for any consideration of any of that reality? I've, I've asked that question a few times. I've written to the Minister of Education and, and the ministry, my MLA, who's the only one who actually said anything by sharing my actual words in a letter. I could recognize which ones were mine. That was nice. Uh, but that fell on deaf ears. So what's the point? Um, oh, I forgot the question. Try again. Just... Uh, have you seen any indication that there is an awareness of what the role of teachers actually is that has, has informed any of this, this new curriculum? No, I've been to the sessions of the, there's one tomorrow night about come, come see what's all, what's, what's in the, come and see it. We're going to show you parents exactly what we're going to do with this curriculum. I've, I've been to two. I've asked these questions. Many people have asked these questions. And they know they don't get answered. They're like, oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, no, like how, given what this in, the, in this document, give me an example of how that's going to be uh, scaffolded, how that's going to be changed. I've had, I've had grade eight classrooms myself where in a group of 30 kids, there's six reading levels all the way from kids who are struggling with the grade four stuff still, even though they're in grade eight, to I had, had a kid who used to leave for the afternoon and go to grade, grade 11 for math, because, you know, <laughs> I've had the full spectrum. Um, and, and in grade eight, you get to the point where you're the gatekeeper, literally with a staff going, you shall not pass, because next year's high school, and that doesn't work the way this does. And that's heartbreaking to sit there with the parents and be like, so yeah, your kid got to grade eight. These skills are not going to fly in the high school. Um, and we need to talk about where to, where to go from there. So is there, is there like, it, it sounds like to me, and again, please correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like to me that the teachers are being handed a curriculum that for many students will be impossible to to navigate and, uh, and hit the benchmarks that they're supposed to hit. Um, there are going and, to be kids who are okay because there are kids who do well with memorizing. There are yeah. kids who do well with uh, just reading it and writing it out and, but, and memorize, regurgitate, flush. That's a skill. It exists. Um, but it's not going to turn into somebody I would like to work with in my business world. I don't, I don't want to parrot. I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want somebody who can just spit back verbatim what's been put in front of them. I need innovators. I need, I need problem solvers. And that's, <laughs> there's no room for that. If you're going to like, teachers are required to teach what's in the program of studies, what's in the curriculum. You have like, 
I have built spreadsheets before with all the outcomes. And then I put my lessons and everything across the top. And I try and make sure that I've hit everything in some way and in different, different strategies, different modalities. Uh, when I teach social studies, I apologize to the grade sevens a lot because it's great. It's Canadian history from the Vikings to just past Louis Riel, if we can make it that far in a year. It is dry. It is dates. It is facts. It is eye poking for most of them because they are so disconnected from Champlain. Like they just, they just don't. Um, so I apologize first. And then I say, we're not going to learn social studies. We're going to do social studies and doing social studies is, is getting, is getting, figuring out why humans do what they do, like where they're coming from and where their perspective is coming from. And that comes from their geography. It comes from their personal histories. It comes from their cultural histories. It comes from who they have contact with, uh, and you have to be able to put that all together to create a worldview for, for that person. We do social studies by trying to measure emotions a lot of the time. And that's, <laughs> right? Like it's, it's an emotional reaction to a historical or it's an emotional reaction to a current event. And it's, it's trying to figure out why humans do what they do to each other. Why do we constantly end up in pyramid shapes <laughs> where there's, few people at the top and lots of people at the bottom, like a feudal system versus Amazon. <laughs> like, it's, it's, <laughs> right? Like it's, it's universal. So we do it and we analyze it. But if you add outcomes, it really does come down to, do you know that we don't use the word Iroquois so much anymore? Because that's all up in the grade three social studies curriculum. <laughs> um, we, they prefer the name Haudenosaunee, and, and, and it's a good story. It's far, it's, okay, someone can correct me if I'm wrong, but the Iroquois is the name that the Huron gave them, and I'm definitely picturing Last of the Mohicans in my head right now. So the Hurons had a name for them and taught it to the French, and that's where Iroquois came from. So that's like the guy you don't get along with giving you a nickname and having it stick. I, I have a guy who does that for me. His name's Matt Wolf. <laughs> oh, Okay, great. So Haudenosaunee is what's in the current curriculum because uh, that's what they want to call themselves. And it's reverting back to Iroquois with the new one. Yeah, the grade three curriculum is all about the Iroquois stuff, which, yeah. Of course it is. American. So here, here's, here's, here's my $50,000 question then. What would you like to see done? I mean, I've, we've had conversations with a few people on this now and the the consensus seems to be that this curriculum was extremely poorly developed uh it is i'm going to go ahead and use the word myopic um and it is going to visit real harm not only on our kids not only on our teachers, as you did an excellent job of highlighting, but it's also going to put, cause some very real damage to our social fabric. Um, do, do you kind of agree with that assessment? And what would yeah, you like to see because, done? Or am I, completely because I do, because when it does fail, it's going to be on the teachers. Because they couldn't make it work. Like, but if I, if I ask you to, to hammer a bunch of two by fours together and I say, okay, here's the tools you're going to get. I'm going to give you some overripe strawberries and an albatross, make it work. Yeah. I feel like I'm not exactly setting that person up for success. Yeah. It's like going to Ikea and picking out that exact bedroom set that you're looking for. Like it's amazing. It's definitely the one that I want. And that's how Kenny and LaGrange see this curriculum. Uh, but when we go to unpack it, the instructions are for the patio set. And that's just not going to work. Like, <laughs> not going to build the, be the bedroom set of your dreams because the pieces and the instructions don't match what you put on the box. And you can, you can show me the floor model all you want. <laughs> but if I take it home and unpack it and that's not what's in there, it's a problem. So what do we do? I don't, 
I don't know. I think we need to, I think we're in the middle of the second Renaissance and honestly, and I, and I think we need to break the box. I think we need to rethink things on a whole other level. If we're gonna spend this kind of money and innovate, why don't we innovate? Like, why don't we actually change the archaic system that has clearly not been functioning properly for the last 10, 15 years? Let's be clear, it needs to be fixed. We're not, we're not no one's trying to ask for status quo here. Um, but this isn't, this isn't how you fix it. This is how you break it faster. <laughs> so what do you do? I need to see, I need to see our schools as that meeting place in the community again. I want to see schools as that, that hub that brings people together. I want to see a, commun a, a neighborhood proud that they get to send their kids to school, uh, just walking to school because it's so great where they live instead of having to try and find that private school because my neighborhood school can't give my kid what it needs or what he or she needs. So I want to see community environment in involvement. I want to see, I want to see teachers teaching what they're passionate about instead of what the budget will allow. There are art teachers in the city who are not teaching art, artists who are trained art teachers who are not teaching art because they have to teach grade three because that's what the budget can allow. There are passionate people who aren't able to share their passions because we have to cover FTE for reading, math, and, and science. Like it's, it's, it's pared down to the point where the passion and the joy um, is the exception to the rule. It's there, there are moments and that's what gets you through It's the little things that get you through, but it's not, like if a music teacher has to go to five different schools a day and I've been the sub who has to do their job and drive to five different locations in a day, how are you building a community that way? How are you building relationships? How are you making school that place, that, that foundation where other humans matter? And I think that you, I mean, I know that there's going to be some people who hear that and go, oh, that's, that's just idealistic and naive. But Why not? Why not be idealistic and naive? Well, I think there's a, there's a lot of benefits to being ide idealistic and naive. Um, but <laughs> I, I think that one of the important counterpoints is that you're, like I said when we started this off, you're bringing multiple lenses to this conversation. And one of those lenses is as a, a business person. And it's interesting because we, the, the other person that we've spoken to already uh, said the same thing. They're looking at the education system. They're looking at this curriculum and they're saying this is not going to produce the kind of employees that I need to be successful in my business. And so I think that there's a there's a even if you you look at the kind of things that you've described, which to me, I totally agree with church. Uh, schools should be cathedrals as far as I'm concerned. Um, but when we're we're talking about why that stuff is so important, it's not just about naivete and it's not just about idealism. There is a legitimate economic argument to be made that if we put if we invest in education and if we invest in those things, then that gives us a tremendous economic advantage, which is the big thing that everybody keeps talking about. Like, I don't think that maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think that you can separate these two things. I don't think that you can say the education system operates in independently from what our economic outcomes are going to be because they are intrinsically tied. Because as you said, and as a couple of other other guests have said, it produces varying qualities in workers uh, that are directly tied to how successful a business can be, especially on the global market. Am, am, am I wrong? Oh, no, not at all. Um, I just saw Neil Patel is one of the top, top SEO marketing people on the internet, one of the biggest followers. And his, one of his posts today was literally, uh, you can't market if you don't care about people. You can't be good at marketing. So start caring. <laughs> maybe maybe that's what this government's problem is. <laughs> <laughs> you can't be good at marketing. You can't be effective in getting your message across if you don't care. 
so start caring that that was there. So 2015 jumped into the world. It was, it was the wild west. It's completely different compared to what it is now. Now it's oversaturated and it's full of gurus and like, oh my God. But 2015 we're, I'm in a room with 2000 other entrepreneurs, the keynote speakers are all me, 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 I, 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 how can I look at me? I'm awesome. Look at like how you can do what I did. And it was all very, very self-centered. And then the last in-person one I went to in 2019, uh, was a shocking difference. There was, they brought it. So it's 2000 plus 3000 e-commerce entrepreneurs. So brand builders, um, all those small brands on Amazon, um, and the keynote speakers came on, there was Dave Mackey, founder of Whole Foods and Sarah Blakely, founder of Spanx and Dave Asprey, Bulletproof Coffee and like all these big brands. And each one came on stage and talked about, um, conscientious capitalism and how making the lives of other humans better is better for their bottom line and how it works, right? Like just making the world a better place and the vibe in the room, the, the me, me, me first and everybody like trampling themselves in 2015 to what the room felt like in 2019 was incredibly hopeful, was incredibly motivating. It was like, wow, we, we really could solve a lot of problems, a lot of entrepreneurs, and you've seen it through the pandemic. A lot of solution-based entrepreneurs have popped up and pivoted and changed perspectives. And now we have the great resignation, which when you read descriptions of what that's happening, it matches pretty accurately with how we explain humanism changing the Renaissance in the grade eight curriculum right now. <laughs> it's, it's, there's some uncanny parallels. So if we are going into the second Renaissance or the second age of enlightenment, depending on how you take it, uh, we're going to need all kinds of different skills and back to basics rote memorization so that you can pass a jeopardy style test is, uh, it's not, it's not one of them. Well, it's interesting that you bring that up because I was listening to an interview with the CEO of Chase Morgan uh, just earlier in the week. And even he, who is the head of one of the larger financial institutions, made a point of saying, if you don't take care of people, you are creating a, a shorter timeline, which may or may not be in the grade two curriculum, uh, for how well and how long your business is going to be. Because if you only go for uh, self-motivated reasons, if, if that's your only focus, then you are going to destroy your, your market. Uh, and the, I can't help but wonder why the government can't apply the same principles. I mean, if, if we're going to talk about, we have a conservative government in Alberta right now, for better or for worse. But if, if we're going to talk about conservative ideologies and free market ideologies, when the guy who runs one of the largest financial institutions in the world is saying, you got to take care of people, though, I, I, I wish they would listen to those people. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's not about, it's about individual, like, em empowering the individual it's not the school is a is an is a it's a pillar of society it's it's what we we've all agreed is a good thing is to make sure that every generation has an equal opportunity to to learn originally learning was supposed to be optimistic and, and, and the life of a peasant in the residence, like when school started, when they decided that education should be a thing, it was there to, to enrich lives and to, to make the world a better place. And everybody having a chance to, to feel that, that awe, that moment of being exposed to something beyond yourself so that you feel more connected to the world. Uh, got turned into the utilitarian uh, cost shuffling. Like the amount of what you need your employee to learn 
rather than investing and teaching that to a well-rounded individual, they've offset that cost onto the schools to the point where the awe is, is, is gone. And that sucks. <laughs> like, well, I, th I can't help but think there's, there's so many examples. I mean, there's no shortage of stories from around the world where, where people are walking for hours, literally, uh, to to get to a school where they can they can learn the start their educational journey, and they're doing so with with not the resources that we have, but they're doing it because of what an a quality education can offer, and they they the value that is placed on education is so tremendous. And I just can't help find myself but wishing that I wish our current minister of education had that same value for it. No, she villainizes the union. It, it, we're a union, therefore our opinion doesn't count. Yeah. Despite the fact that you guys are the, the front lines who are experiencing all of the things and seeing all of the things. I mean, there's... With multiple degrees to our names, <laughs> like, let's clear. We didn't walk off the street. We came in with uh, expertise, and and those of us who've been in the game long enough, the experience backs up the education. And most people my age have done their masters while they're teaching, while they're raising kids. Like that's pretty normal stage in life right now. <laughs> Is oh, I'm doing my master's. Oh, what are you doing it in? You're getting even more specialized. That's great. Are you going to be able to use it? No, I'm in grade three. Well, I'm a, I'm a big, one of my favorite, I'll call him a philosopher, has an expression that he uses, and it's uh, knowledge without mileage equals bullshit. Yeah. And I, I think that to unilaterally say, I'm not going to the, listen to the people with mileage speaks for itself right there. Yeah. Be because because we have an ATA, we have a professional association. Yep. Yeah. Therefore, we can't possibly be right. <laughs> but it's not ideological at all. <laughs> Andrea, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to have this conversation today. Uh, is there anything else that you would like people to hear? Is there anything else that you'd like people to do in order to try to get through to this government, to this minister, uh, just how severe the stakes are that we're playing with? Uh, based on the number of people I know who've personally tried to talk to their MLAs, who've shown up, who've called, who've emailed to only get boilerplate coffee and paste responses uh, or, or answers from the minister that don't actually answer the question they just keep using the same talking points um my mla actually wrote a letter but i haven't heard from her since so i don't know where she is i i haven't talked to her recently um not since june so <laughs> i'd like to uh, maybe, maybe check, check the tropics out. yeah no she's home <laughs> uh yeah maybe i'll call again this week but what can people do uh there's the crew, I don't know, there's 500 pages of teacher speak uh, that doesn't make sense to teachers. You could plow through that. That seems like a lot of time. <laughs> um, the Edmonton Catholic School Board did an amazing job dissecting it and going, it, going through it line by line. Um, the Black Gold did an amazing job summarizing it so you don't have to read all 500 pages and and wonder whether it makes sense um talk to a teacher talk to a teacher say honestly what's up are you okay well it's, yeah that seems to be the the big takeaway so please from from everybody here please pass on our thanks for the work that you guys are doing and the circumstances that you're doing it under to all of your 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 coworkers and the people that you you sub for because it is heartbreaking to hear of the the what you guys are having to navigate and the cost that it's taking on you so yeah the cost is real um 
you you don't want to give up your uh, ability to feed your family, but you also don't want to give up the ability to be there, like really be there and not just like exist, which is kind of where the world is going right now. A lot of people are asking for the privilege of hanging out with their own families, like family time and time off and, and the ability to, to fill those batteries back up. So like a box of donuts in the staff room is great, but like, <laughs> it's not the same. Uh, teachers need, need more time to just be human with, with the kids, to really get to know them well enough to be able to say, this is what that kid needs or that kid needed five minutes to tell me that story. <laughs> uh, but that's not how it works when you've got 40 minute classes and 36 kids. So um, they need class sizes. They need, they need community, community involvement. And when we're allowed to go back in the schools as visitors, be a visitor, be a volunteer, show up. Awesome. Ask to cut it out. Here, can I cut out that assignment for you? Like all the all the little crafts that your kids come home with <laughs> that probably got cut out by a teacher during a staff meeting. <laughs> wow. Well, thank you again. Uh, and I all I can say is that I, I, I hope that more people start listening and start paying attention because I think you've really highlighted that we've got a problem here and it's going to require some... With Some the, work. World is, the world is crazy it is, school needs to be that place where kids can go and just, just take that hat off. You know that thing at the, the one where the guy comes home from work and he hangs it on the tree and then he goes in? Kids need to be able to hang stuff up and come into class. And if that means they need to have a counselor on site to just talk through some shit, then that would be great. But we're also sharing one of those between five schools. Oh, that's, that's a brutal note to leave things on, but it's how we started. So I think it's appropriate. Um, <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> thank you again, Andrea. As always, if you appreciate the kind of content that we're trying to produce here, please consider signing up to be one of our Patreon supporters at www.patreon.com slash the breakdown AB, because it's through the support of our Patreon supporters that we're able to continue generating the kind of content that we do. Thank you so much for taking your time to listen. Thank you for your support and stay safe.